Welcome to this week's Rider Support. This week, we're going to talk about tire wear. We're going to talk about style guides. Stay tuned to the end because we have some amazing fueling tips if you're doing hard group rides or races. But first, are the rumors true? Is Lachlan Morton about to attempt Mark Beaumont's around the world record? Let's dive in and find out. Okay, first question, Anthony. Word around the campfire is Lachlan Morton is set to announce an around the world record attempt. Do you know if this is true? I don't know if it's true, but there has been a lot of chat on forums about the round the world attempt. I think it is true. It seems like it's true. It was kind of leaked last year by someone close to Lachlan that he did want to have a go at it. And given that we'll get in and break down what he's doing right now, his crazy mileage in Australia, like a circumnavigation of Australia. But that and the timing and how serious he's taking the Lifetime Grand Prix at the moment knowing that he's kind of wrapping up his gravel slash road season, the timing would seem perfect to attempt the round the world record. I won't be surprised if we hear shortly after he finishes Australia that he's going to just take a short break and dive in to try this round the world record really soon. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, he really is made of different stuff. I'd love to get into his brain and kind of figure out how it works, the, the mileage he does, the lack of sleep and just this drive and motivation he has that, to keep on going. And the uh, videos that EF do following him around on these adventures are really amazing insight into, this is not easy for him. This is, this is very dark times. It's big mileage. It's, it's big, big mileage. Yeah. So the fastest circumnavigation of the globe is held by Mark Beaumont, who we had on the podcast and that's actually really worth it. You might remember, I always forget the link, but we might remember the link to Mark Beaumont episode below. Mark Beaumont, he kind of set out with this romantic Jules Verne idea of around the world in 80 days and he completed it. So the current world record was set in 2017 by Mark Beaumont, the British endurance cyclist. And it's 78 days, 14 hours and 40 minutes. He cycled an average of 386 kilometers per day, riding over 29,000 kilometers. And that's one of the rules for the round the world, which we'll get into in a minute. You need to complete at least 29,000 kilometers for it to be considered around the world. He crossed four continents, 16 countries, and he ended up breaking that by quite a significant margin. What was really interesting on Mark Beaumont's interview was his pacing strategy. So Mark Beaumont, we talked last week about bikepacking and how you can do this if you want to boost your endurance, this idea of segmenting. He used that really well. So he had four four-hour efforts per day. So 16 hours a day riding, but he segmented it into four four-hour time trials with very short little breaks. In you them. have to be really strategic, so you can't just, obviously, you're not going to go on and do an attempt like this and just wing it. We had the amazing uh, Lael Wilcox. She just broke the, broke the women's record for the same thing a couple of weeks ago. She finished it in 108 days, 12 hours and 12 minutes. And again, she is another absolute beast you can check out loads of her content on youtube as well and she's uh one of the one of the key things that you seem to need for these ultra endurance uh, attempts is just a lack of sleep and you know being able to push through that uh, massive I don't know, fatigue them a little bit like they're great athletes oh no i'm not taking that away from them at all but it's definitely something that's a factor for sure yeah. but if you look at like Mark Beaumont, you know, at 16 hours riding a day, it's still leaving plenty of sleep time yeah, as well. True. So it's not a total, you can't do total sleep deprivation for 80 days. It's not Badlands where you can just push through for three days with Rob Britton, eight minute naps. I think it's primarily physical. When we watched the Tour Divide documentary with Lael Wilcox, though, she did say that she was riding for, I think, 20 hours, but two of those hours every like while she was riding, were going in, getting food admin, and yeah. eating and admin. Yeah, basically anything that goes wrong with your bike. So it's very, very full on. It'd be very interesting to see how Lachlan, you know, approaches it. Was he the same kind of personality at all as Mark Lachlan's? I think Lachlan's too. I don't know Lachlan super well. Uh, I, I don't really know him at all. Like, you know, hung out a little bit at Ruler a couple of years back. But I think the public perception of Lachlan is very different to the killer that he is inside. I think he plays this laid back surfer dude, Aussie beach bum, who just likes to ride his bike and is very romantic about just listening to his body and how in keeping he is. But he's working his 
part of the Orange Seal Academy, one of the best coaches in the world. He won Unbound this year. He's still a World Tour rider. He's the 1% of the 1%. I think Lachlan is a more strategic beast than we give him credit for. He had a, there was a very interesting article that he wrote for Roller about three or four months ago. And he kind of said that he wanted to revisit his... That was brilliant, actually. Yeah, it was amazing. And that he wanted to revisit his whole, you know, how he approached the bike, how obsessive he was about it. And I don't know, it it seems like he has completely thrown all of that out the window if he's going for these But still kept a public perception of I'm chill back and I'm laid out, but yet... He's geeking out on the marginal gains of, you know, closing off that gap in the center of your chest to lower your coefficient of frontal drag using new puck helmets, you know, as part of that unbound thing as well. The, dis- so, the distances he was doing today, even in, uh, or this week in Australia, were oh, absolutely insane, weren't they? Yeah, they make my eyes water even thinking about them. It's like you route through, I know you have some of them there, but they're like most of them north of 400 kilometers a day. Yeah, he had one big day, 588 kilometers. That's his biggest day he did a couple of days ago on the 19th of September. And the day before that, he did 489 kilometers. Yeah, I just, just can't find I feel like I don't even know how I would drive that you know and just not be absolutely exhausted like i remember i rode from dublin to kinsale during the summer and i think that was 303 kilometers something like that just over 300 i was wrecked the next i was fine that day i could have kept riding i could have done another 100 200k light permitting but i was ruined the next day i got up my joints were sore i felt like i had the flu and it was probably two days before i came around and felt the love for riding again so how he pushes himself to do his back-to-back stuff is... Before, before we move on from that, what kind of a bike is Lachlan doing the Australian trip Ro- on? Road. It's a road bike. Okay, yeah. so again... With aero bars. With aero bars. So you're not going to be going and doing any off-road when you're going for an attempt like this. You're just going to be on the smoothest roads that you can find. Okay, very interesting. It'd be cool to see him do it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think the political climate is slightly changed, though, since Mark Beaumont had done the record. And Jenny Graham had the female record as well. And... So it's kind of unfortunate that around the world doesn't have a defined route, that there's not, this is the route you have to do. It has certain rules around it, like you need to ride 29,000 kilometers at a minimum. You need to start at a point and finish back at the same point. If you zoom out and you look at a map on the globe, you kind of want to trace a circular route. That's pretty much the fastest way. But because of wars, political concerns, economic instability, some regions aren't possible. Like Mark Beaumont's first route went through Ukraine, Iran, Pakistan, India. His second attempt went through Turkey, Iran and Pakistan. Like none of them are going to be possible for Lachlan to go through. So he needs to figure out the logistics part of that as well. Yeah, I hope to see him do it. It would be such an amazing win for him if he, you know, if he achieved it. Yeah, of course. He's he's just so cool. He makes... uh, uh, he makes cycling cool. He makes gravel riding cool. Back bike packing cool. Makes me happy. Bike packing is not just like a, a sport for middle aged people that you see and you're like, wh- you know, what are they doing with their summer? He's made the whole thing look cool and made everybody kind of want to go out there and adventure and push themselves and have a couple of nights maybe sleeping in, in the side of a ditch in a bivy. <laughs> he just made it look so cool. <laughs> okay, we move on to the next question. Anthony, I've been part of a club for a few years and we have got a great group of racers and compete together throughout the year. The problem is that although we compete in the same jersey, there's no cohesiveness as a team or all riding for the one goal, i.e. working together to get that one person a stage win or GC win. I'm 31 and I guess I will be the most senior rider, so have kind of fallen into an unofficial role of manager, for want of a better word. This winter, I want to help the team learn to ride in that more professional way. Any advice? And that's from Tim, Tim Knight. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one because he's used the word team as a part, as distinct from club quite a bit, which I think is important because if it's a club, people have different motivations for joining the club. Some are community-based, some are, you know, building endurance. Everyone's motivation isn't always racing. So as kind of a, you know, de facto manager coming into that situation, you can end up imposing your moral thought structure on the rest of the club, which, you know, doesn't always rub everyone up the right way. But when it's a team, people tend to be on the same page and they're both all like, okay, we're part of something and we're on a collective journey. So I think that's important to establish at the outset. And then if you have six, seven guys in this team 
I think a good first step is to establish team roles, like to figure out, and this will be quite intuitive. You'll know who the best climber is, who the best sprinter is, who the best breakaway lad is, or kind of roller is. So try and understand what role everyone plays in it, because then you can start to formulate little tactical drills. Like you can plan lead outs and you can play around with that. The thing for me is if you have one, you can't have one out and out team leader. It's not a, we're a pro team and we're all going to pull for Poggy all day long, every day. People aren't going to buy into that because where's the win in that? Sure, you can create a culture that when the team leader wins, we all feel like we're winning. But there ultimately has to be a case of what goes around comes around. So if you say, okay, I'm happy to be a part of leading out the sprinter, but in return, I also expect when we go to a hillier race, which doesn't suit the sprinter, that he helps position me into the climbs. So I think that's why it's important to have different you know, roles within the team that are clearly assigned. And then you can practice that in training. You can start practicing the sprinter riding full gas into the base of the climb for the climber. You can practice the rollers sitting on the front of the group on a train and spin, you know, doing a two up and, you know, saving other lads for later in the train and spin. Practice the lead out where, you know, you reverse engineer it. The last lead out man jumps a 400 to go, brings your lead out sprinter, brings your sprinter to 200 and the sprinter goes from there. But if you reverse engineer it all the way down, where does man three start his effort? Where does man four start his effort? And you can have fun with it. And when you start having fun with that as well, you'll start to realize how hard communication is at speed. Like when you're doing 50 plus kilometers an hour, and the wind is, you know, changing direction as you come out of a corner and you're on the wrong side, you know, clear, effective communication is hard at speed when there's wind noise and when your heart rate's 190. So that all needs to be practiced and the trust part of that needs to develop as well. A good way, I think, to approach the season is to ask the riders who's prioritizing which race. And then you have maybe one target race per rider and you get buy-in from everyone to help that rider. And maybe it's not he has a chance of winning it. Maybe it's he wants to race there because it's his hometown and he wants to put on a good show. And winning for him might be first category two rider home. And that can be where it's difficult. Where can you get a buy-in from a good cat one rider to help a guy to get a cat two prize? That can be difficult. And the only way I've found on teams to do this is where you build a group of friends where it's a group of buddies that feel like they're pulling for each other. And like, you know, my teams that I've been a part of that are the best teams. Like no one's ever had to ask me to pull. No one's ever had to ask me to get a bottle. It's just so clearly obvious that this is what you should do at this time because of your buddies. I think that's team camps. Yeah, team camps. Like everyone gets to know each other. You suffer. You might go out for a couple of beers. You, as you said, you actually get to know the person rather than just superficially. You know, if you're staying with somebody in the same yeah, room. You've and got to hang out. Be you have to hang and, out. You know, yeah. meet their partners. And, you know, it's you're not pros. So it's important to build that friendship. It's more than just well, I'm doing the job, so I'll get on with the guy beside me because I'm paid to do it. Like, that's not the dynamic we have at Amateur. That was something that Facilis, who was a um, Mark Cavendish coach, who we had on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about Altitude Camp and how much training they did and basically l- laid out Mark's training day. And a huge part of it was hanging out with the rest of the team. Yeah. So it was like a big focus on not just going to your room and sticking your headphones in and watching Netflix. It was actually time team bonding time with the team because at the end of the day you're going to rely on these people to dig in when the time gets tough for you and i think for amateurs it's important to be inclusive with the whole family you know with some guys you know late 30s early 40s have families where other guys you know have girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever but being inclusive and bringing everyone together on occasion whether it's team dinners and nights out it's much easier then for athletes to get buy-in from their partners when everyone feels like they're a part of something is that what you were doing with me, making me stand on the side of the road in the, in the rain for all those years? Okay, I think that's really good. The very best of luck with that next year. I hope you have an amazing season. Okay, the next question is, Anthony, what did you think of Pogaccia on Peter on the Peter Atia podcast? You haven't listened to it yet, have No, you? I haven't heard it. It only came out yeah, two days ago, I think. Three days ago by the time this airs. Uh, it was good, I thought. It's really difficult task for Peter Atia because he's trying to tailor a conversation to two totally different audiences. So your hardcore cycling fans want to tune in to hear Pogaccia. They want to hear what's per kilogram. They want to hear what his VO2 max is. Is he going to go after, you know, I think currently he's won three of the five monuments. Is he going to go after San Remo and Paris-Roubaix, which are the two he hasn't won? Is he going to try to attempt all three Grand Tours in one year? 
But Peter Thiel's main audience is health enthusiasts. So to balance those questions, like I put myself in Peter Thiel's shoes, how do you ask? Like, we know exactly who our listener is to the podcast, who our viewer is to the podcast, so we can speak to their frustrations, to what they want to hear. But how does Peter Thiel sit down to write those questions? Is he targeting the questions to, you know, user A or user B? I, I thought he'd done a brilliant job of keeping it broad enough that your health enthusiast could get some enjoyment out of it, but specific enough that, look, it's not the best cycling interview I've ever heard because it's not deep enough for a cycling fan. But I thought he did a good job. But how did uh, Tade come across? Because he's quite a funny guy and Peter yeah. T is quite, he can be a little bit, you know, serious. Yeah, he's not very funny for he's sure. He's not funny, no. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that it was Charming. very interesting. Yeah. yeah, you name dropped the girlfriend more times than anything. Well, fiance, <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, it sounds like they have an amazing relationship and he, she seems yeah. like such a huge part of his training where she's, you know, everything from just making sure he gets out the door training to training partners to little experiments that run together around heart rate variability and stuff like that. It, he seemed chill. It was in between, it was recorded in between GP Quebec and GP Montreal from what I could gather, which is, would have been at the time recording one week out or 10 days out from Worlds. So he was relaxed enough considering he's attempting for the first time since 1987, the Triple Crown. So who yeah, knows? And as, as you know, from being from Ireland, we have a particular interest in if he takes that i still i, I, I wouldn't mind him <laughs> yeah same i i wouldn't mind him at all because i i was kind of too young for the stephen roach era so it would be good to see him take it okay hi anthony and sarah what do you make of the new rules about racing under 23 when you have a world tour contract already that's from joyce could do you just explain that a little bit because joyce didn't go into very much detail yeah so currently the world world championships on last week finishing this weekend with the men's elite road race on sunday and currently if you are a world tour rider like our very own darren rafferty riding for ef education and darren can ride the under 23 time trial he could ride the under 23 road race even though he's a world tour professional so he's at the very top tier of cycling with his trade team but he can step down and race the non-top tier race because he's young enough to do so this made a lot of sense years ago because there were not that many riders were under 23 and world tour riders, but increasingly for me is doesn't make that much sense. I know there's been critics both sides. You say Benji on Lantern Rouge wasn't a, a fan He's of the He's not a fan change. of the new rail, I, I don't think. Yeah. So my rationale for liking it is, you know, so I've come up racing the grassroots scene in Ireland. And typically the way Ireland has gone is we've anywhere from two to five standout professional riders. We don't, we're not like Denmark where we've 20 or 30 riders. We have two to five really good World Tour riders, and we normally have a limited number of places in the World Championships. So the limited number of places in the World Championships, if a rider's 23 or a rider's senior, as long as they're World Tour, they're getting those places. And But now we're, we're in a place where we do have slightly more World Tour riders than we have places. So the World Tour riders are occupying the spots we have in the Elite Road Race and the spots we have in the U23 race. And it stifles the pipeline for other riders coming up because now the kid who's 22 and he's thinking, oh, will I go full-time this year? Will I train full-time this year? It's hard to justify living in France or Belgium making 50 quid a week racing division national races because I'm not really in the limelight. Now he has an incentive to go, actually, the World Tour lads can't occupy the U23 spaces for the Worlds. I might get picked because I'm the best under 23 that's not contracted. I might get picked for the Irish team to ride the world championships. And that can be a great incentive for keeping a rider continuing racing this year. And then who knows where to go from there. I just think it's, it keeps more lads engaged in the sport. We are so excited to announce that we are partnering with Whoop. Whoop are changing the game when it comes to wearable technology and health monitoring. Whoop is a wearable health and fitness coach that provides you with feedback and actionable insights into your sleep, your recovery, your training, your stress, and your overall health. Sarah and I have been using Whoop for years, and we love the insights it provides into our body's inner workings. It really gives us a look under the hood. And you're gonna see Matthew van der Poel, Richard Carapace, and other elite level cyclists wearing Whoop, but it isn't just for those superstars. All the data is personalized to your unique physiology and fitness levels. If you're interested in taking control of your health and your fitness, 
So if you can excel in all aspects of your life, you have to go and check out Whoop. Go to the URL now, which is join.whoop.com forward slash roadman. I'm going to pop that in the description below and you're going to get a free month's access to Whoop membership on me promise you won't regret it. Yeah. And it's, as you said, like a stage for these riders to really go out and show what they're capable of. And the world, the riders that are attached to world tour teams do have an advantage with regards to, I know that they're not always given, you know, they're not all on UAE or whatever, but they do have the benefits of sports, like massage therapists, good equipment, good equipment exactly. Plus the stress is relieved from them from having a paycheck coming in to ride their bike. that is though, like the U23 riders now, like they're cannon fodder. Like if you put Darren Rafferty, who will have a real chance of winning the U23 world road race this weekend. If you put him now into the main race, he's cannon fodder with Pogaccia and Van der Poel and cause he's not at that stage of development. So it's, there's an yeah. argument on either side. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Okay. That was a great question. Thanks Joyce. Okay. Hi, Anthony and Sarah. How often should I change my tires? I'm new ish to cycling. I'm a covert COVID convert. <laughs> and although I do drop my bike in for services, I feel I should maybe learn some of the skills and knowledge around it myself. Am I right in saying there's no indicator on bike tires like there are on car tires? No, there's an indicator on them, yeah. There is. So, okay. well, any depends on tires. I'm riding Continental at the moment, GP5000, and there's small round indicators in the tread. When they're no longer visible, that's definitely time to replace the tire. You could track mileage there's wear trackers out there i think strava have one integrated in where you can say you're changing tires and it'll track the mileage you might get depending on road conditions weight weather four thousand to eight thousand eight thousand be a lot of kilometers four thousand to say seven thousand kilometers out of a set of tires they probably will start giving you a little bit of as they wear down as they might start giving you a little bit more hassle anyway they kind of naturally will well show that's itself. my like lying for when I change my tires, grip is starting to go on mm. or before grip starts going, I always feel like I start puncture. Yeah. Cause I've had tires before and if I've gotten a couple of punctures in a row and I, you're just like, let's whip God, them off yeah. and change them. Puncture yeah. resistance is always the one for me to go first. Mm. Uh, now if you're riding in rough roads, like boreens, borderline gravel roads, if you're riding wet roads, that's going to, those mileage recommendations are going to come way down. I think puncture, puncture resistance is the best kind of barometer of it. If I get one puncture, you go, I'm unlucky. If I start puncturing twice in a week, I'm getting close to pressing the order button. If I yeah. puncture three times in a week, they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. And take care of your tires because they are the things that are. Take care of your tires and they'll take care of you. you. Well, it's true. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you like your teeth, take care of your tires. Okay. Next question. What's that should be the tagline for Continental. <laughs> What's your latest best purchase for the bike? We have a club member that is having a milestone birthday in a few weeks and we want to club together and get him some cool stuff. I love this. All right. So I got tail fin before I went away bike packing. I, it was rock and roll. I got the carbon rack. Definitely don't need the carbon rack unless you just won the lotto. Actually, probably more drawbacks than not for the carbon rack. The aluminium one is brilliant. The design from tail fin, it's brilliant. I'm sure they have some sort of patent on it. If you're going bike packing, or even if you're not going bike packing, I've been putting that on and getting the fish. And riding yeah, out and going coming back to the with like fish and yeah. veg and stuff to tail fin on. <laughs> I love that. The thing that I should have got, which I didn't get because you told me it was goofy. When I was going bike packing, I should have bought a quad lock for my bike. Because the quad lock is what holds your phone on the stem. Now, they're goofy under 99% of circumstances. But when we went bike packing, what you'd find is, okay, so you have your bags on, tail fins on the back, your bags here. And then you get to the city, you know, you're staying in Split or something in Croatia. You get to the city and you've booked an Airbnb and now you're going through traffic, fatigued after doing 12 hours and you've one hand on the bars trying to follow maps Google on maps. your phone because, yeah. you know, you're Wahoo or Garmin. You're not going to stop and export a GPX to get to your hotel. So you're just following Google Maps for the short term. Quad lock. All three of us that were bike packing were like, "Oh my god, why are you being up right now?" I will give a pass for quad lock if you are bike packing, but even then, I'd be, I wouldn't be posting it all over social. I just think they look so goofy. Plus, this this uh, listener didn't say that this chaff is a uh, a bike packer. Let's. Is there anything? I'm gonna make quad lock kill. You go. <laughs> Hey, you have a lot of faith in yourself. You have a lot of faith in yourself. I'm like Lucky. I'm going to need to bring Lucky in for this <laughs> one. If Lucky had a quad lock, he's, he wouldn't even be able to make a curl. So if you're thinking of something different, as in for 
a road racer, someone who is a, a cyclist who likes to race or maybe do long sportifs or something. We we were looking into... Well, this is landed, yeah. so... Gimbley. We're not, not sponsored. sponsored. No. Not sponsored. <laughs> not sponsored. Uh, I haven't tried it. <laughs> Ghibli, yeah. So explain what Ghibli is, because this is an investment now for you. Mu- you'll have to really, really love your uh, club mate here for his it's a bit spicy for him. birthday. But it, you could all definitely get a lot of use out of this. I think this could be something that, depending when I test it and see if it actually does what it's meant to do, which I'll explain in a second. But I think it's a good idea maybe to club together yeah. and get it for the whole and group. And I'll use it. Yeah, I totally agree. Club. Yeah. So I've had loads of guests recently talking about aerodynamics, you know, from Matt Bottrell to Dan Bingham there last week or the week before. Everyone's talking about aerodynamics. Wind tunnels are quite accessible, inaccessible. Velodromes are quite inaccessible. So the solution that has emerged and a few companies are doing them is real-time aerodynamic sensors, coefficient of frontal drag sensors. I had Larry Warbass from Agitozer to Catalan on the podcast. Haven't released it yet. That's probably going to come next week or the week after. And he's talking about how this is his big focus now over the winter is playing around with these type sensors to figure out his real-time coefficient of frontal drag and then seeing can he improve it so himself. So explain to us what CDA is for the, the people down the back who, who, <laughs> don't, who don't have a clue what you're talking about there. It's, I was explaining it to Wes, our videographer off air. It's like air exerts a resistance on people. So the barrier to you traveling faster, it's the, the pressure of the air. It's like a fluid on front of you. So the smaller you can make your air surface area cda the a is for area the smaller you can make your area the faster you're going to travel through that pocket of you know water in this example so this device measures your cda you want your cda to be as small as possible it measures that so you can tweak around what position is exactly so you could go well if i go into the drops my cda is 0.22 where if i go into the hoods my cda is 0.21 and then, but I haven't used it yet, so I don't know how user friendly it is. I am going to do, I'm going to get the founder on the podcast. He's going to talk to me about how to set it up. And then I'll go and do a bunch of tests and then I'll report and back we'll and tell you, everyone how you know. I'm finding it. Andrew, you will really have to love your club, mate, because this is 878 euro. But I also I, don't buy it till I test it. Yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> hold, hold off, hold off. One suggestion that I think for a great present for your friend is a trip. So I know we're... That's more expensive. <laughs> well, like if they if they they're gonna club together. I don't know how many's in it, but like I was thinking go, of five or each. <laughs> <laughs> go out, go on a week long cycling trip. Bring him out there, make loads of memories, get loads of photos, get him a set of tires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think a trip, go to Girona, go to Mallorca or go do something kind of a little bit off the beaten track. And that would be my advice for this guy's uh, big, big birthday. Okay, next question. For loads of questions today. Hey, Roadman, seeking advice on ride fueling when riding a race or fast group ride. Heart rate is too high almost consistently to even swallow regular food down. Should I just try to consume gels alone to get through the whole ride? A lot of times the pressure is on the pedals. Speed is so consistently high that even getting the gel out of my back pocket and tearing the package and swallowing is tough. Any thoughts? And that's from Mr. Fuzz, 6744. Mr. Fuzz, 6744, I feel your pain. That was a late edition. I was literally just scrolling the YouTube comments just Mm. before we hit record and that came in. It's a thing. It's a thing. Fueling through fluid is your only way. Yeah. Uh, Pogaccia on the podcast, uh, something a lot of people do, but it's just interesting hearing Pogaccia say it. They have two different concentration bottles inside UAE. A lot of teams do this as standard now, even amateur teams, where you have one strong dilute, one weak dilute. A strong dilute could be 70 or 80 grams of carbohydrates per bottle. A weak dilute could be 30 or 40 grams of carbohydrates per bottle. When we were over at the Tour de France, we saw into the EF, their boot were all the tea balls and they had the exact same. They had like a big X on yeah. the bottle for the higher dose. And it was so just, it was clear to everybody. So I think that's just the easy answer because even, yeah, as you say that, that in gel, if you can't get a gel out of your pocket, you're not getting Harry Bow out of your pocket. No, you're not getting you're not chewing. Cheering. No, absolutely not. Be careful though. I've uh, recently tried one of the the high carb. You tried Bix. So Bix, wasn't working. Bix did, gave me the shits as well. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to admit on, you know, on 
the podcast that that's what happened to me. But yeah, it did. Yeah. Really bad. Actually, I think that Pagacha did talk about that as well, that his changed his future, uh, his nutrition. He was getting really bad gastro problems directly after a race. So I, I think you got to just go with what, what will work. Yeah, yourself. what will work for me may not work for you. Yeah. So it's kind of difficult to Like the to one do that. I did try was Morton, which is super strong, tastes horrible, but it didn't mm-hmm. give me any gastro problems. Whereas the beta fuel from Power Bar, which is super strong as well, same concentrate. I was doubled over with that cramps in my stomach. So you've got to just try it. Try everything. Yeah. And I think, so for my advice as somebody who has like often completely come apart because I haven't had the confidence because of the pace to reach around and get food is, and I try and eat naturally. We had Velaforte as a sponsor for a long time. The drink was good from Velaforte. The drink was amazing. But for the food wise, which was all natural, really promoted it. I used it constantly when I was training, but for those really fast training rides, and the odd race that I did, you just got to get sugar, don't you? And it's like you, you, all of that kind of the that stuff, the the, the balance, the the dates, the natural sugars and stuff kind of goes out the window. And it's just about figuring out what you can tolerate it's and ball, get ball. yeah, get as much carbs in as possible. Also, not to harp on this question, but Mr. Fuzz, I can go back and watch last week's rider support. I think it's like the five golden rules for boosting your endurance pre is going to be important as well, like starting to ride with a full glycogen store. And that starts the day before the ride, the morning of the ride, and in the part of the ride where the pressure is not on. Like it's unlikely, unless it's a criterium, that the flag drops and it goes full gas from the start. There's normally ebbs and flows in it, so you can eat the more solid flu- food during the easier parts. But then when the, ra- the pace on, you just got to go with the balls. Hey, road man, excuse the short interruption. I love riding the bike, but on account of being so busy with the podcast at the moment, I'm now what's called a time crunched rider. I never thought I'd see the day. But I have a tool. I'm using what bike to keep myself sharp and on point with specific sessions to maximize that available training time. I have a what bike Adam right here in the recording studio beside me. And when I have an hour in between interviews, I jump on. It's removing all the friction points for me. There's no more 10 minute setup, unfolding legs, banging my knees off stuff, getting my hands dirty, the usual connection issues. It just works every single time. The Adam's perfect for virtual racing as well because it has crisp gear changes, it has 1% accuracy, and it has max gradient capability of up to 25%. If you're looking for an indoor trainer, I honestly couldn't recommend this any higher. I've been using a Watt bike since 2013. Honestly, it's the last indoor trainer that you're ever going to need. If you head on over to whatbike.com now and use code ROADMAN10, that's R-O-A-D-M-E-N, T-E-N, and that's going to get you 10% off your Watt bike. Yeah, you're so right. Just get some food in when the lulls are on. Okay, last question. Anthony and Sarah, somewhat of a style question here. If you were buying a new bike, what colour would you get? Black. <laughs> yeah, same, black. Black, I think it's cool. Some of the paint shops are amazing. So I just got home from Sea Otter in Girona and the the it's the custom paint jobs that bike companies are doing are at, not even the custom ones the two retail direct to retail ones are amazing the details like the paint job on the seat post even now they're doing it's just all so beautiful like you can get beautiful patterns and you can get the paints with kind of speckles in them things like that so black maybe with a, a speckle in it buy a bike that you like most yeah Don't i agree buy a bike that we're saying is a nice color or yeah. your club mates like buy the one that's like I naturally makes your heart skip a beat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because when I I have the bike that I'm riding at the moment, my road bike bike is black, but my uh, my gravel bike is bright orange, and I absolutely love that. The tractor, I think it's a, a really epic and unusual color as well. So, yeah, I don't know. Go go with what your heart says. Robin, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Rider Support. Up here. There's a podcast we done about the five golden rules for endurance. Definitely worth checking out, especially if you're a Mr. Fuzzy 6744. <laughs> and down here, you can subscribe to the channel so you don't miss all the amazing content we have planned in the coming months. Talk soon.